Hello everyone, welcome to Asian Pacific Shows. In this episode today, we are going to talk about a very special country which is related to Indo and Pacific region. Our country is France. Uh, France is a distance power to the region, but at the same time is a resident power in the region. It is very interesting. Uh, France is a resident power in Indo-Pacific with the biggest exclusive economic zone and at the same time uh, has more than uh, 1.5 million uh, residents in the region. This uh, situation makes uh, this region extremely important for France and also make it in uh, France very important for the region. That is why uh, today I am going to talk and ask my guest. He is uh, familiar with the region and he is also from Paris. Uh, my guest is uh, Dr. Antoine Bondas. Dr. Antoine is a research fellow and a program director at the Foundation Paula Research Strategic Group, FRC. His research focuses on China, Taiwan, and Korea's foreign and security policy and strategic issues in East Asia. He advises senior government officials as well as private entities in France and Europe and participates in numerous high-level track 1.5 dialogues with top Asian government officials. He has testified before the French National Assembly and Senate, uh, the European Parliament, the OSCD, NATO, and uh, at the UN. Uh, welcome, Antoine. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be joining you, I mean, in late evening for you in Southeast Asia and in the afternoon for us in Europe. Yes, uh, we have in a different uh, time zone. I, I'm exactly now in Indo-Pacific region, I think. Indeed. <laughs> uh, Antoine, please, what is the importance of Indo-Pacific region for France? And why does France see itself in a position to include it in Indo-Pacific region? Can you give us brief details or in the sure. details you're talking about, please. As you said perfectly, I mean, France is a resident power in the Indo-Pacific. I, I would not say it's a distant power. It's, it's a resident power because from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, from uh, Mayotte to the French Polynesia, from uh, Rainan Islands to New Caledonia, we have more than 1.6 French I mean, 1.6 million French citizens living on French overseas territories in the region. That, as you say, more than 92 percent of the French maritime space that is located in, in the Indo-Pacific. We have 7,000 soldiers permanently deployed on these territory, of course, to defend our sovereignty over there. And this is what makes actually France unique among all of the EU member states compared to Germany, compared to Italy, compared to the Netherlands, to Sweden, etc., we have sovereignty interests in the region. So we have very specific interests. So we are a resident power. And uh, we've had actually in the 2010s growing thinking conceptualization in Paris on how actually to design kind of a strategy for the region. For many years, we discussed the Asia Pacific as, as a broad region. Um, and we had actually a security strategy published by the Ministry of Armed Forces for the Asia Pacific. And then in 2008, 2018, sorry, 2019, we started to design a so-called Indo-Pacific strategy. So it was first presented by President Macron on a very important trip to Australia. And then uh, we had uh, the Ministry of Armed Forces presenting its own security strategy for the Indo-Pacific. More recently, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs presenting some kind of guidelines on the importance of the Indo-Pacific. And everything was combined uh, early, earlier, I would say, this year in July, July 2021, in a very important paper, the so-called French strategy for the Indo-Pacific, that was published just before President Macron visit to Japan, just ahead of the Olympics, Summer Olympics, and a visit to French Polynesia. So we don't clearly have deep interests in the region. We also have a very clear strategy. And that strategy, that's very important, is not only military or security oriented. It was initially uh, with a very huge security and defense focus for, once again, some very specific reason, that is uh, the sovereignty interest of France in the region. And since it has been much more broadened, it's a much more comprehensive strategy dealing, of course, with the economic aspects, with uh, environments, 
uh, with uh, technology, with development assistance, uh, etc. And, and that very comprehensive strategy is the one that is promoted these days in France. When, when we're talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy and the France as a country involved with Indo-Pacific region and uh, Relaset published it is strategy. Uh, my question will be about is the France accession to the Indo-Pacific region is a kind of strategy related to rise of China? So I, I would say it, it's part of, uh, of the equation for sure. Uh, but the French strategy is neither against China not only about China, but to say that it's completely unrelated to China would be, of course, hypocritical. China is, of course, part of the region. It's one of the major players in the region. And you cannot have a regional strategy without putting China, I would say, uh, in the equation. So for sure, it's partly related to China. But once again, it's not an anti-China strategy. Uh, it's not, I, I don't know, something to contain China's rise, to contain China's economic growth, etc. Uh, the reality today in the Indo-Pacific is that we have growing interest over there. The Indo-Pacific is basically two-thirds of uh, global growth, economic growth today. It's uh, some 90 persons of the emerging middle class in the next 15 years will be in the Indo-Pacific. In terms of environment, it's five out of the 10 largest uh, pollu I mean, emitters of carbon emission, uh, more than 85% of the people living of the fish industry uh, or the fishing industry live in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, many island countries are very affected by climate rise and, and the rise of the seas, etc. So, so we have much interest that goes beyond, I would say, our very sovereignty interest. And in these interests, of course, China is one of the players. Of course, when we discuss maritime security, it's not against China, but for sure we have concern. We have concern about what's going on in the South China Sea. We have concern about what's going on in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and, and, and Taiwan, once again, is part of the equation. But what is very important, it, it is not anti-China. It is not against China. And it's much more for our own interests than, again, the interests of another country. Antoine, recently, uh, you know, uh, there is an important agreement taking place in the region, AUKUS agreement. Uh, I'm going to ask one question about AUKUS agreement. Uh, what kind of implication of AUKUS agreement will be on the France Indo-Pacific strategy? So I would say there are two dimensions. The first one is, is very French related. I would say that the decision of the Australians to give up, to drop the so-called deal of the century we had with Canberra to uh, build together 12 conventional propelled submarines. Uh, it was a very important and massive deal, uh, both a military and industrial deal we had with Australia, and they scrapped that, uh, that deal in favor, of course, of American-made nuclear propelled uh, submarine. So it was a shock for the French, and it was a strategic surprise, for sure. Um, and the French authorities and many experts reacted very angrily, I would say, uh, and they were openly, I would say, even hostile of, of the decision. What is very important to explain is to say that um, many French people, including within the administration, may understand why Australia did that. Uh, the perception, the Australian perception of the threat coming from China has changed of the last few years and they have decided that they needed to maximize the american security guarantees and to align de facto on the us and that's something we can understand of course from the french side what is hard to swallow is the method the methods uh linked to the to the decision that is basically to to discuss it in the back of the french to get an agreement with the american and the british without letting letting us know and to kind of surprise us with that. And for sure, I think we can agree that this is the shot in the back. Uh, this is a method that is uh, unacceptable between allies, the US and, and the UK, partner uh, with Australia. And, and many of the French anger, I would say, uh, is, is quite legitimate because for us, it has huge economic impacts for Nava Group, the company and its subcontractors. It has huge diplomatic 
consequences because it, it's made the relationship with Australia very complicated in the short term. It has political consequences for the president because uh, let's not forget we have presidential election uh, in, in less than, I mean, in six months, six or seven months. Uh, and it has also potentially military consequences because these kind of arms deal are very important to make sure the French defense industry uh, remain autonomous and have the capacity to finance some new projects, etc. So it has huge consequences. Where I would disagree is on some French comments <coughs> that AUKUS is either completely counterproductive or beneficial to China or very detrimental to, uh, to the French interest. I think on that we need to avoid an overreaction that would be, I would say, uh, even more uh, counterproductive to, to what is going to what is going on now. So the first one I would say is that the idea that the United States has pushed France aside in the Indo-Pacific and marginalized the country, I think it's a wrong analysis. Once again, and, and we started with that, France is a resident power in the Indo-Pacific and we're not going anywhere. Our interests are not going anywhere. So we are here to stay and we are here to promote, of course, our interest. The second aspect is not, I mean, I mean, the, the United States is not isolated in the region. And you know, many French comment to say that because of that, the US uh, is going to lose its allies, is going to lose its credibility. I think it's a completely flawed analysis. Uh, by leaving Afghanistan, by announcing AUKUS, the US is signaling that its rebalancing strategy to the Indo-Pacific is a reality. What was announced 10 years ago by President Obama in Australia, actually in November 2011, is becoming a reality. Yes, the US has withdrawn from Afghanistan, they have withdrawn from Iraq, and they refocus their political uh, attention, their military capabilities, their investments on the key region that is for the US interest, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Same, I think we need to be very careful with some French arguments saying that because of that, the EU is going to lose interest in the Indo-Pacific, that the EU will not be willing to play a security role in the region, etc. First, the EU interests in the Indo-Pacific remain in economic aspects, in technological aspects, in, in environmental aspects, um, as, I mean, development assistance aspects, etc. It remains. So it's not going to change everything. Second thing is the EU does not intend to play a key military role in the region. This is the reality. And we just need to get back to the recently published drafts of the EU uh, cooperation strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific. So it's a joint communication so far. It, it's not the, 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 the final strategy, to be very clear to, to the audience. That, uh, let's say, a first draft that will have to be adopted by the Council, so the member states, and also by the parliaments. And in it, in the key mission, the key objective, there is nothing related to security and defense. There is one section on security and defense, focusing mostly on maritime security, cyber security, etc. But, but once again, the EU Europeans are, are realistic. They have no capacities in the Indo-Pacific, unlike the French. They have no, uh, I would say, huge ambition. They will play a role where they can in maritime security, in, in non-traditional security, let's say maritime piracy, this kind of stuff. But we're not going to play a, a hardcore military role the same way the Australians or the Americans could play. So, so once again, I think we need to really put into context uh, what, what's happening now. Uh, it's a huge blow for France, a political blow, a military blow de facto because of, of the defense industry. But we need to move forward. Uh, we are moving forward right now with the US. Uh, so as you are aware of, uh, President Biden called President Macron, a first statement was published uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, the, 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 the Secretary of State uh, Blinken was in Paris actually last Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, was actually also in Paris on Friday. I got the opportunity to meet with him uh, on, on a few days ago. So they, I mean, we are trying to put the US-France relation back on track. Uh, it's complicated for political reasons, for sure. Uh, but what we need also to do is to get the relationship with the Australian back on track. So, of course, we will have high-level interaction at the minister of the present level in the coming weeks uh, or the, even the coming month. But we need to make sure that at the working level, at the think tank level, we keep engaging with the Australians because we have many uh, common interests in the South Pacific, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and we need to promote and defend them for sure.
Anton, uh, mostly you touched to the about the, the, the France-US relations. How about the UK and this Arabs agreement? Uh, sure. What kind of implication will have the sure. France-UK relation in the Indo-Pacific and uh, another part of the world? Sure. For example, so, so the UK is and remain a very important partner to France. Um, we have actually a security partnership, a military agreement with, um, with the UK that we signed in 2010 the so-called Lancaster House uh, military agreement. And after the US, I would say UK is, is the second most important military ally and military partner of the French. Yet we are in a very difficult sequence, political sequence because of Brexit, because of many bilateral disputes in terms of fishing zones, in, in terms of, of, of de facto implementing the Brexit deal between the EU and, and the UK. So I would say we are in a very difficult period. Uh, on AUKUS and that decision, the first reaction of the French was to snub, I would say, the British. That's why we recalled the French ambassador from, I mean, in uh, Washington and Canberra back to Paris, but we did not do it with the French ambassador in London. The idea was to send a very strong message to the British that we were kind of ignoring them, uh, that we were snobbing them, etc. I think they got the message and, and Prime Minister Johnson got the message. Um, the problem we have now is that no, the British are not irrelevant in AUKUS. And the, the argument that, you know, the British just wanted to piece up the French basically and so they, they, they took part of the deal, of course, is a completely flawed analysis. The British will play a very important role in implementing the deal because they are the only one with the experience and the expertise in getting some hardcore, sensitive military technologies from the US. And it's not a coincidence, it's before Australia, the UK were the only country to have benefited from, new, from the nuclear propulsion technology coming from the US. So of course, the, the UK will play a very important role with the Australians to train the Australians to help the defense industry in Australia to adapt to what's going to happen in the coming decade. So the, the, Ameri the, the British are going to play a very important role. Then if we get back to, to UK, France and the Indo-Pacific, Brexit uh, has had a negative impact for sure within the EU on the Indo-Pacific. Because before Brexit, France and the UK were the two EU countries with significant interest in the Indo-Pacific and military capabilities. The fact that Brits, the Brits are out of the EU is not a good thing for the French. You know, many, many could think that, oh, the French are going to be left alone. Uh, we don't have the Brits anymore, so it's a good thing for the French because they can promote themselves, be the only one, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work this way. Uh, when you are alone, it's much more complicated to convince the other Europeans to do more to be more active, to be more ambitious, et cetera. So I would say Brexit have had a negative impact for French interest in trying to convince and mobilize the other European countries. Yet, we have been quite successful. Quite successful because last year, G Germans uh, in September, then the Dutch in October, published some um, policy guidelines on the Indo-Pacific. Then the three countries, so Paris, Berlin, and, and Amsterdam, made sure to try to convince the other EU countries and, and Italy, Poland, Sweden, Portugal supported actually that trilateral initiative on the Indo-Pacific. It became a reality in March 2021 when the Vice President and the High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Josep Borrell, uh, said publicly that he would be working on the strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And then in September, so three weeks ago, uh, the strategy was released, at least the joint communication, so the draft I was mentioning uh, earlier. So despite Brexit, we are still succeeded in getting the Europeans to move. Uh, but we need to go further, and the Brits being outside of the EU, it makes it more complicated for the French. But once again, it does not mean that we will not have cooperation with the British. Uh, we need to have this kind of cooperation, but it will take time. And for sure, at the political level, it will be quite complicated for President Macron to meet the Prime Minister Johnson and, and you know, in a friendly way and candid way to move forward, etc. It's going to be complicated in the coming month, for sure. Antoine, we are in a time, especially US and its alliance system, try to contain China in the region. Following the Elks Agreement, is it possible 
to France make it as a relation with China more softer than before? If if we if we what if the Europeans or the French are? I did not hear the question. Sorry. Yes, I said we are in a time, and U.S. and its alliance system uh, try to contain China in the region or constrain China in the region. Is it possible after uh, following the AUX agreement? Is it possible for France to make its relation with China more softer than before? I, I really don't think so, actually. And I know that some French people, intellectuals, most of the time of the record, you know, just after August say, oh, you know, General de Gaulle, former French president, would have been to China, blah, blah, blah. I think it, it's, it's a completely wrong analysis. Um, if... General de Gaulle would still be president, he would not go to China. He would go to New Delhi, to India, to try actually to balance between the US and China. And this is what we're doing now. I mean, India is and remains a key strategic partner of France in the Indo-Pacific. We had actually three key countries, key partners in the Indo-Pacific. India, Japan, and Australia. India and Australia were very specific because in addition of the strategic partnership, we had also massive arms deal, de facto defense agreement, for mostly for Rafale, so the fighter jets with India, and on the submarine with Australia. We kind of lost Australia in a way, and, and, and it's not lost per se, but of course the, the strategic partnership is not as strong now that it was even a month ago. Uh, so India remains the top strategic partner of France. So what happened already, because we had a phone call between President, Prime Minister Modi and President Macron, is a strengthening of France-Indian relations. Will we get closer to China? I really don't think so. Uh, not because uh, we don't want it or anything, but because this is not in our interest to get closer to China, again, the US, or I don't know what. The French strategy is quite clear. It's not non-alignment, per se, so we're not in a non-aligned movement, or I don't know what. The idea is we don't want to align neither on the US nor on China. But it does not mean that we're not going to take side. In terms of values, in terms of interest, of course we are closer to the US. And the US is a military ally. The US has a political system that even though he has a lot of problems, uh, and we have saw that during the Trump presidency, especially in, in January this year, um, we are still much closer in terms of political values, of democratic institutions, etc., to, to the US or to China. So we're not going to get closer to China than to the US. Yet, it means that on many global issues, we have an interest in engaging with China on free trade, on climate change, on biodiversity, on international organization, on peacekeeping operation. And the idea is that we refuse any strategy that would be to I would say openly contain or confront China, etc. There is a rivalry, for sure, between the EU and China. And the EU strategy on China is quite clear. We consider China as an, a, a, a cooperation partner on climate change and health, as an economic competitor, what it is, uh, and a systemic rival. Systemic rival is means basically that we consider that China as a model of governance that is trying to rival us and openly uh, discredit our own domestic uh, governance system, our democratic and liberal uh, political and economic system. So it does not mean that we're going to wage a war against China. It doesn't mean that we want to confront China. It means that there is indeed a rival. And what is complicated for the French is to navigate between this kind of uh, cooperation, competition, and confrontation elements. The French strategy remains quite clear. Uh, and, and once again, on the military aspect, on the defense aspect, we are, and we will remain, much closer to the US and to China. And to give you just an example, uh, a, a French maritime surveillance ship uh, was sent to the Indo-Pacific like every year, and he, he, he navigated uh, through, he sailed, uh, through the Taiwan Strait very recently, actually a few days or a few weeks ago. So we, we keep sending a message to China that, of course, we, we're not into a military conflict or we don't want military confrontation. That, of course, not the point. But we have defense interests. We have sovereignty interests. We will defend them. 
and in terms of maritime security, in terms of liberty of freedom of navigation, etc., we want to make sure that China is hearing our voice uh, and that that we are defending our interests. That's all. And when uh, you're talking about India, uh, let me ask one question about India. After the uh, AUKUS agreement, even the weak possibility, is there any probability to uh, France provide uh, this submarine to India instead of Australia? Yeah, I mean, there has been a, a discussion, I would say, in France about that. I'm not saying at the government level, but, but uh, de facto discussion. Um, what was surprising with AUKUS, to be very honest, is that we believed that the U.S. had a taboo. We believe that the U.S. would not transfer this kind of technology to another country. Uh, and one of the surprises come from that. Not from the Australian decision per se, uh, because we knew that Australians have, had some concern about the deal, that they were thinking whether it was enough or not to, to face a, what they perceived as a China threat, etc. So, so this is not a surprise. The surprise is, wow, the U.S. accepted to transfer technology they have never transferred for 70 years. And now they do it. So this is a surprise. It means that the taboo of transferring this kind of very sensitive technology is being lifted. Will France use that taboo lifting, I would say, to export to India, Brazil, South Korea, or other countries that are very interested and publicly interested by... I think UAE also interested. Am sure, I sure. The, the, the country that have been publicly and officially interested by this kind of technology, uh, will we start having a discussion? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you have in this kind of discussion several variables, I would say. That's one thing to say that, oh, why not discussing the transfer of technology? Then the question is, is it in the French interest to do so? If you take the example of South Korea, would it be in the French interest to do that? I doubt so, for several reasons. First, if South Korea acquire or even develop on its own nuclear propelled submarines, it violates the 1992 inter-Korean agreements on the denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. So that's a problem. Second, if a country, be it France or the US, is in open discussion with South Korea to provide the technology, of course China will backfire and China will sanction try to pressure these countries. So the question is, is it in the French interest to have this kind of discussion uh, with some countries? Uh, but what is sure that the taboo is being lifted. Uh, I think the US will also discuss in the coming years, maybe decades with other countries. Why not Japan? Why not Canada? Why not, I mean, Indonesia? I mean, other countries in, in de facto providing that technology. And I think the message of the US is, is why not? <laughs> Uh, but for France, even though there might be some discussion, there are many variables to take into account before saying that France will engage in pragmatic and, and very straightforward talks with countries, be it India, Brazil or other countries, in transferring this kind of technology. Yes, uh, another question will be about uh, the region again. I'm going to ask about the Taiwan in sure. general, you know, as... Uh, the tension rising again these days. What is the importance of Taiwan for France and its relation with China in general? So France, as you know, have had very complicated relation with China over Taiwan in the early 1990s. Because in the early 1990s, the French uh, provided Taiwan with uh, Mirage 2000 fighters and with uh, frigates, Lafayette type frigates. Um, and of course, uh, it, it complicated, let's say, the Sino-French relation, especially in the middle of the 1990s. Ever since the French have been very reluctant in openly supporting, not Taiwan per se, but even mentioning Taiwan. And as I used to say over the last few years, there has been kind of a strategy in France to invisibilize Taiwan, to, to make it Taiwan invisible, I would say, in the French politics. And you had no public statement on Taiwan. Um, Taiwan was never mentioned in any French strategy, uh, etc. Right now is changing a little bit. 
It's changing because, um, as you know, the Europeans at the EU level accepted to uh, publish a statement with the US in June this year to mention the importance of stability in the Taiwan Strait. That's something new on the EU side, actually, to be that vocal and explicit. Um, France accepted in the framework of the G7, the day before, actually, the EU-US statement, to mention Taiwan. France mentioned Taiwan in a bilateral meeting with Australia because in end of August, we had a two plus two, plus two meeting, so defense and foreign affairs with Australia, and Taiwan was explicitly mentioned, the importance of stability in the Taiwan Strait. So that, that's something from France on, on, the, on the bilateral and multilateral level. Meanwhile, at the EU level, for the very first time, uh, the EU strategy for cooperation in the Pacific mentioned Taiwan several times as an economic partner, including in the semiconductor uh, industry, and the importance, once again, of maintaining stability in the, in the Taiwan Strait. So I would say there is a clear revolution. The French and the Europeans in general are, are starting to be more vocal about Taiwan. Not vocal, you know, in, in any de pseudo debate on establishing diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan, etc. That's not the debate. I mean, it's not at all about that. It's not at all about, like the Chinese say, you know, uh, supporting or helping the Taiwan secessionist, I don't know what. That's not the point. The point is actually very simple. The French interest and the European interest is in maintaining stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait is in avoiding a conflict in the Taiwan Strait. Because any conflict in the Taiwan Strait would not be local, would not be regional, it would be a global conflict with huge consequences for the Europeans. And some very basic figures. We have more than 15,000 EU citizens living in Taiwan. We are the first investor, the Europeans, in Taiwan. Taiwan is key in supply chain, critical supply chain, including, of course, semiconductors. And of course, if you had a takeover of Taiwan by force, by China, it would use a huge message to any democracies that you have this kind of authoritarian regime like China invading democratic regime and democratic country. So, of course, that would send a very bad signal. So the Europeans have an interest in avoiding this kind of conflict. Does it mean that in case of a war, we would intervene? Let's be very clear. We don't have the capacity, the Europeans, collectively, to militarily intervene in the Taiwan Strait. That's the reality. So, uh, but we still have some leverages, political, economic, diplomatic leverages. But what is very important for the Europeans is not to intervene, is to avoid, to prevent a conflict. And as such, we have a leverage. We have a role to play by being more vocal. So this is a so-called declaratory diplomacy, what we started to do once again this year, starting in June 2021. Also, sometimes it's discussing uh, in an official way with the Taiwanese uh, think tank, social, uh, civil society, etc., and to do everything we can, once again, to prevent a conflict. But sometimes we lack, and I will conclude on that, some coherence. If you take the French position, once again, we have been more vocal this year, that for me, very welcome, very important. And at the same time, if you take the French strategy for the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan is never mentioned. I'm not saying, once again, to mention Taiwan as a, as a diplomatic partner, or I don't know what, because it's not a diplomatic partner, but at least to mention Taiwan as an economic partner, because that's the reality. We have huge trade with Taiwan. We have scientific, we have educational, we have cultural cooperation with Taiwan. We have a lot of cooperation with the Taiwanese civil society. Uh, we have, de facto, a lot of interaction, and, and we keep... I would say refusing to mention Taiwan just to make sure uh, we, we do not kind of piece off the Chinese. I think it's very counterproductive. What would be counterproductive is to assume, I would say, our interest. Our interest is to say that we need stability in the Taiwan Strait, is that uh, we have de facto interaction and cooperation uh, with the Taiwanese society, that's the reality, uh, that we do not intend to change the status quo that we do not intend to normalize diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan. That's not even a debate. But, but that we have an interest in maintaining the status quo. And I think we need to be more vocal and more proactive on that. 
Yes, uh, Anton, in previous question, you mentioned three countries which is important uh, for France in the region. One of the India, one of Australia, and the uh, other is Japan. I'm going to ask, what is the position that uh, privileges India in France strategies in Indo-Pacific region? What, what is the what, sorry? Uh, what is the the position that privileges India uh, ah. in, in France strategies in Indo-Pacific? I, I don't know whether there is an Indian privilege, I would say, but there is a very old relation between France and India, including on, on military cooperation. They back from the 1960s, so it's a very old uh, military cooperation. Over the last few years, let's be very honest, there has been a very strong will, both in New Delhi and Paris, to deepen, broaden, strengthen cooperation. We've had a lot of uh, bilateral meeting at the very high level. Uh, President Macron visited India, and, and just for the anecdote, uh, when he got elected in, in 2017, his first travel to Asia, to the Indo-Pacific, was supposed to be in India. It ended up to be in China in January 2018 because of agenda issue. He was supposed to visit India in the late 2017 and you had local election in India and it was complicated to organize the meeting and, and the visit. So we, <coughs> we, we first had the state visit to China and then I think it was in March, maybe 2018, uh, the visit to India. But the, the message we wanted to send initially during the, the Macron presidency was India is a very important part. And we will go to India first, even before going to China, even though China is as well a very important partner. So we have deepened the relationship with, with India uh, a lot. Uh, we've had a strategic partnership, actually a very old one, because it was signed initially in 1998. So just to give you an idea, Japan was 1995, strategic partnership. Uh, India, uh, 1998, and Australia much more recently, because it was in 2012. Um, with India, of course, the uh, agreement for the supply of 36 Rafale aircraft in September 2016 and the strategic partnership agreement in 2019 for the construction of, of I mean, the, the, sorry, the agreement also for some, from, not in 2019, but for some nuclear uh, power plants have been very strong and very structuring, I would say, uh, partnership in the relation. What has been also very, very important is that uh, we have tried to increase uh, minilateral, I would say, or, or trilateral cooperation between India, France, and Australia. That has been something that many people have been working on over the last few years. Uh, we've had so a trilateral uh, dialogue with, um, with, uh, with India and with, um, with Australia. Uh, we've had even the, the, the kind of trilateral meeting at the very high level because it was done also uh, at, uh, at the minister level. So uh, it was a so-called trilateral minister dialogue. It was in May 2021, actually, uh, this year. Uh, the, the French have been much more active, including in the, you know, the, the inf what we call the information fusion center for the Indian Ocean region because we have assigned a liaison officer uh, in it. We've organized a, a very important event for the symposium for the navies of the Indian, in, for the Indian Ocean uh, in July this year in the Iranian Islands, so in Indian Ocean. So we have actually multiplied, I would say, the channel of communication and the platform for discussion with India at the bilateral level, at the trilateral level with Australia, at the uh, multilateral level in the Indian Ocean. So yeah, I mean, India is and remains today, I would say the top strategic partner for France uh, in the Indian Ocean and, and more broadly, of course, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, let me ask one question from another side. Sure. What is, what is the importance of France for region, especially for the countries located in East, uh, Southeast and Northeast Asia? That was a tricky question. Because I would tell you that, of course, they consider that we are credible and important, and that's why they want to engage with the French. Uh, but I think, you know, for, for many countries in the region, France is 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 and, and is actually remain a, an important player for for several reasons. The first one is that France is 
the only EU country, once again, with military capabilities and direct interests in the Indo-Pacific. So when we say we want to engage with the Indo-Pacific countries, we mean it. It's, it's not about politics. It's about interest. We do it because we need it, because we have an interest, a deep interest in doing it. And we're not going to go anywhere. And even if you have another president, our interests in the region are not going to change. The second, so, so there is, I would say, a sustainability and a credibility in our engagement. The second aspect, of course, is we are the only EU countries that is a permanent member of the Security Council. So compared to the Germans, compared to the Italians, compared to the other EU countries, we have maybe even more global interests, but even more global responsibility to act and to do more in the Indo-Pacific. So this kind of, of responsibility because of the Security Council make France a, a very important partner for Japan, for South Korea, for Australia, for New Zealand, for, for India, etc. And you can see that even with smaller countries, with New Zealand, we have strong partnership and strong agreement. You have the so-called Auckland call or Auckland statements you know, on, on, um, on, on the fight against uh, terrorism online, etc. I mean, a very strong statement on, on cybersecurity, etc. It was promoted by France and New Zealand, etc. So you have a lot of, of initiatives. So it's not only talking, it's a lot of key initiatives. You have de facto cooperation in what we call the Pacific Quad with Australia, New Zealand and the US in fighting illegal fishing, etc. So a lot of things like this. The third aspect, of course, for the, for the countries in the region is that France cannot be labeled as anti-China. And you know, with this AUKUS partnership, sometimes being labeled as anti-China for some countries in the region that are kind of, you know, not very comfortable with it, France remain kind of a specific and a different, uh, different country. If you are basically in South Korea, South Korea for many years has been very reluctant to talk about Indo-Pacific because they considered that it was too much anti-China or at least politically seen as anti-China and they wanted to avoid discussing it. Um, now they're starting to use the term even though they have their own strategies, it's called New Southern Policy uh, Strategy. Um, and, and what is important is that France for South Korea now is an ideal partner because we cannot be labeled as doing an anti-China policy. Uh, we promote strategic autonomy, just like Korea, just like India, just like Australia before. Uh, and we are kind of a very, very specific partner, a partner that is both credible, that is engaged in the law and committed in the long term, that has huge responsibility, including at the national security, I mean, the, the security council level, that can move the other Europeans, that can get the other moving, and be more committed to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that is not labeled as anti-China. Does not mean once again that we are pro-China, I don't know what, but we are not labeled as anti-China. So I would say that for many countries in the region, from South Korea to Indonesia, from India to, to Japan, uh, we are a, a, a valuable partner, even if we have, of course, limited capacities. Uh, we don't have the capacities of the U.S., that's not even the question, uh, but, but we have some capabilities, we have responsibility, we have interest, we have uh, credibility, and this is, I think, what makes France a very specific European country in the Indo-Pacific and towards the, the Indo-Pacific partners. That's great. Uh, Antoine. What is the approach of, uh, I'm going, going to ask about North Korea because these days, uh, North Korea testing the, the, the missiles again. What is the approach of France to North Korea and uh, what kind of role does France can play in the North Korean nuclear program and even in denuclearization of North Korea? So, so North Korea, I mean, the North Korean nuclear and ballistic issue uh, remain uh, a top priority for the French and as a role for the European Union, because it, in terms of non-proliferation today, the North Korean crisis uh, is, is, is and remains one of the, top, uh, of the top priority. And it's not because North Korea did not test long-range missiles recently or did not test nuclear weapons that is not on the agenda of the Europeans. And, and you see that uh, 
most of the time when you have a test, you have a French reaction condemning the test, etc. The EU also is trying to be more proactive. So, so this is very important. And there is a key European interest in making sure that we address the issue of non-proliferation. So France uh, is one of the two EU countries not to have a diplomatic relation with North Korea. Uh, it's France and Estonia. Uh, it's a heritage of history. I mean, it's a bit complicated, but we don't have diplomatic relations. Yet, we have de facto relations. We have a cooperation office in Pyongyang, uh, and not many countries have diplomatic representation in Pyongyang. So in, in within the EU, you only have uh, the Germans, the Swedish, the Polish, the Bulgarian, the Romanian, and the Czech. We, we used to have the British, but they are no longer part of the EU. Uh, so it means that even though France does not have diplomatic relations, we have a, dip, a de facto diplomatic office. So it's what we call a representation office. It's not an embassy, it's a representation office. And that representation office is working a lot on, on two different issues. It's humanitarian assistance and cultural and educational cooperation. Uh, we have finance over the last few years, huge um, archaeology <coughs> cooperation projects in, in, in North Korea. When you go to the city of Kaesong at the border, uh, at the inter-Korean border, the, the Namdaemun project, so that the southern gate, the old gate of the cities, etc., are being actually renovated by a French arch uh, archaeologist, etc. So there are some form of, of, of cooperation. It is very important and very useful. And on the humanitarian issue, uh, France is also doing a lot. So France is most of the time presented, you know, as very hawkish, very pro sanction etc. Uh, that is partly true, for sure. France is very concerned. So, so France is pushing for the implementation of the sanctions. And at the same time, meanwhile, we do a lot on humanitarian issue. In terms of uh, EU member states, France over the last 10 years has been the third donor in terms of humanitarian aid. Uh, be, be, I mean, behind the Swedish, the Germans, they are the French. Uh, you have four NGOs permanently based in North Korea. Uh, all of them are from Europe. I mean, I, I mean before COVID, of course, but, but among the four permanently based NGOs in North Korea, the four of them are from the European Union. Two of them are from France. Then you have one German NGO and one Irish NGO. So the French, be it the French government, the French NGO, civil society, the French experts like me, I mean, I, I created the very first dedicated research project and program in France on the Korean Peninsula a few, few years ago, etc. You have a, a lot is being done. And uh, I'm sure we can do more. I've been promoting, you know, over the last uh, few months, the idea that um, the, the French with the Germans and the Swedish, the three of us, kind of a, what we call the E3 formats, it would be a new E3 format, so European three formats. We, we need to do more. We need to push for more uh, humanitarian um, initiative, including in, in uh, addressing the natural disasters in North Korea and trying maybe to help North Korea to build an effective uh, natural disaster crisis mechanism, you know, to better prepare response uh, against natural disasters. So, so I'm sure we can do more et cetera, on, on that field. But but France, once again, has, has two legs. One leg is non-proliferation is key. And what's going on these days and these weeks in North Korea is not positive. Uh, the, the multiple tests is not something that is positive for regional stability. Uh, and at the same time, we are not stupid hawkish, I would say, <coughs> or close-minded. We know that there are humanitarian concerns. We are doing a lot, uh, including at the Security Council, actually. We are trying to make sure that the NGOs that are willing to get some exemptions to be able to ship, to send uh, humanitarian assistance can do it. Some German NGOs actually got some waivers, exception waivers, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we, we are doing the best we can. So I would say the French position is trying to be very moderate, even though we can do more. So, uh, uh, Anka, Anka, I think there is yes. an echo in your side. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't touch anything, so I, I, I don't know what's going on. No, no, yes, okay now. Basically, these important activities, 
uh, what what is the exact role of France in the uh, DPRK EU relations? So, as you know, uh, EU and DPRK have had diplomatic relations for 20 years because it was agreed in, in, in 2001. Yet, there are no EU ambassadors in the DPRK and there are no North Korean ambassadors in Brussels. Uh, the, the, so, uh, the relationship is, is complicated. The official strategy is called critical engagement. So critical because of uh, you know the, the human rights and non-proliferation issue engagement because we still address the humanitarian issue and once again the EU is doing a lot and uh, you know the Europeans EU plus member states over the last ten years it's more than two hundred million euros that were spent to help the North Korean people a lot of projects on the ground etc so so a lot is being done even though we can do more um, France play an instrumental and a very essential role in terms of EU DPRK relations, because we, we first have the expertise uh, on North Korea, in, including on the non-proliferation issue, uh, even the other country, including the Germans, of course, have an expertise. Um, we are one of the key countries in terms of implementing sanctions and making sure they are being implemented. Uh, France uh, deployed, actually, some military assets in the Sea of Japan or in the Yellow Sea to monitor ship-to-ship -ship transfer that are illegal in terms of coal, in terms of oil. You know, they are illegal in, in terms of international law because of United Nations Security Council resolutions. And just like our British partners, we are kind of uh, uh, having some surveillance on what's going on. So, so the French, I would say, are doing a lot uh, at the EU level. Yet the problem we have is that sometimes we lack some coordination and cooperation. Uh, between EU countries, and we need to do more with the Swedish. And that has been actually my take over the last two or three years. Uh, Sweden is often, you know, France and Sweden are often considered as the two extremes in, in the European Union. The Swedish are presented as pro-engagement, and the French are presented as pro-sanction, or pro-containment, or you call it whatever you want. The reality is a bit different, of course, it, it, it's a bit more complex, but kind of the two extremes. What we need is more cooperation between Paris and Stockholm. And if we get that with Berlin, the three countries, then we can convince the other Europeans to do more and to be more proactive. So I would say that France plays a very important role in terms of EU DPRK relation, as well as Sweden, as well as Berlin, and as well also as any country with diplomatic representation in North Korea, and that's the case of the Eastern European countries, Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, and Bulgaria. And just to let uh, your audience know, we used to have, of course, dozens of European diplomats, not from the EU, but from the member states uh, in Pyongyang. Uh, all of them, almost all of them left last year because of COVID. And the very last one, a Romanian diplomat, left actually a uh, few days ago from the DPRK. So there is right now uh, no European diplomats anymore uh, in North Korea, unfortunately, because of COVID. So, uh, what is the, the, the sentence or approach of France uh, for a possible unification on the Korean Peninsula between South and North? I think there is no debate or stance. I mean, we we, we are advocating, like everyone else, a peaceful ratification if the two people want it, I would say. Uh, what we want is to promote stability, to avoid uh, crisis escalation and escalation, to avoid military confrontation, and any initiative that can contribute to peace and stability is welcome. Uh, we will see in the coming weeks with the South Korean decision, there will be a vote at the parliament to, to vote a kind of uh, end of war declaration. Uh, it's very important to see the final text, etc. That that's something that could be supported by the French, even though I think the French are, are kind of skeptical, just like the other Europeans, because this is a unilateral decision from the South Korean uh, National Assembly. Uh, we don't really see the the impact it will have and, and the the reasoning behind it, even though the intention, of course, is welcome to 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 promote peace and stability. Uh, so that's some very uh, pragmatic step that will be discussed. But in terms of reunification, once again, I think there is no stance. I mean, the, the, the French, uh, it's not up to the French to decide, I would say. And the French will not avoid or, or, or block or prevent 
a reunification if there can be a peaceful reunification. And, and what we want, of course, is once again, peace and stability and, and a bright future for all of the Koreans, not only the South Koreans. I have one last question, Antoine. Yeah. What, what will be the, the what kind of uh, things do you have or how do you see the France, the future in Indo-Pacific? I think we, we need to adapt the strategy. Uh, I wrote actually, and I think your audience will be able to, to get it, a very long paper actually the day before AUKUS. So it was not, it was just a coincidence. I, I was not aware of AUKUS back then, but uh, on the need actually for us to better adapt our, our strategy. Um, what I see is the need first to better promote and explain the strategy in France. Uh, because we need a very broad popular and political support in France. And so far, I would say, you know, most of the French people are, are not very aware of the French strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And this is very important because, you know, it's not about foreign policy. It's about domestic politics. Uh, the French Indo-Pacific strategy has both an international and a national dimension because we need to promote the development and the integration of the French territories in the region. The one I mentioned before, Mayotte, French Polynesia, Reunion Islands, uh, New Caledonia, etc. The second aspect is that uh, we need to better integrate, uh, I would say, the, these territories in the strategy. So some international conferences have been organized. So I mentioned before Reunion Islands, in 2021, we had a, a very important French-Japanese uh, meeting in 2019 in New Caledonia, but we need to do more. And, and my advice is also in terms of decentralized cooperation to better highlight, highlight the potential of these territories. And one idea basically is why not highlight agriculture? Uh, and we could make these territories pilot areas for sustainable agriculture and excellence that would serve as models for the neighboring countries that have share similar geographical and climatic characteristic, be it in the South Pacific or uh, in the Indian Ocean. But what is also very important is the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy dimension and the need to adapt it in the region with the partners and the different actors. And, and what I think, and it was, once again, my, my thought written even before AUKUS, is that we need to make sure that we have more cooperation with the other countries. South Korea, including, and I've been pushing that for, for more than two years now, because we have a lot of overlap and common interest with the new Southern policy of South Korea. We need to create more trilateral formats. I mentioned the France, India, Australia dialogue before. We, we need to do it also, I think, a France, uh, Japan, Australia dialogue could be uh, very interesting because we share common concern in terms of illegal fishing, uh, resilience in supply chain, uh, um, Chinese influence in the South Pacific, etc. We could also think of a trilateral uh, formats with South Korea and Indonesia on environmental issues and reforestation, etc. So there are many possible uh, formats. And last but not least, I think we need to duplicate, replicate something we organized with the Japanese two years ago. It's a so-called comprehensive maritime dialogue. Um, that uh, is something basically that is key for one reason. Maritime issues lie at the core of the Indo-Pacific for geographical and political reasons. And this kind of format, comprehensive maritime dialogue, uh, allow you actually to discuss a large number of issues, economic, security, environmental issues, while insisting on a very inter-ministerial approach that is too often lacking in so many countries, including in France. And this uh, dialogue could be held with, uh, with South Korea, they could be all with uh, Australia, even though it's going to be complicated in the short term, with Indonesia, why not with Malaysia, etc. Uh, so once again, I think the future of the Indo-Pacific for the French depends on how we adapt our strategy, because once again, our interests in the region are going nowhere 
uh, the French territories are going nowhere. The French citizens are going nowhere. We still have interest uh, and, and they will remain. The only question we have, and, and I will conclude on that, is the future of New Caledonia. So that French territories uh, between basically Australia and New Zealand, uh, there will be a referendum that the third referendum actually in December uh, 2021, this year, on the future of the island and to know whether they want independence or not. So it will be very important. And if, of course, the, the New Caledonian people vote in favor of the independence, uh, it will have huge impact for, for France. Uh, but once again, even with the independence of New Caledonia, if it happens, and I hope it won't happen because, uh, I mean, New Caledonia is part of the French Republic and we have a lot of interaction. We have all like lots of friends and very good cooperation with, with, with everyone in New Caledonia. Um, it, it will force, of course, the French to, to adapt even further the Indo-Pacific strategy. But once again, the French Indo-Pacific strategy is what we make of it. Uh, we need to adapt it. And AUKUS is actually forcing us to adapt it maybe faster than what we expected. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. We already uh, over one hour time. Thank you so much for your questions. You are, you are most welcome. Uh, you provide. Thank you for uh, your knowledge, your horizon about the region. You provide me and my audiences. I also so thanks thank a lot. Thanks to you for allowing uh, and enabling a, a French and more largely like a Europeans to interact with the audience and to make the French policy and European policy better known. Uh, in the region. So, so once again, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for uh, my audiences that they have been us until now. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. See you in the next program.